Bible right here in Hebrews chapter number 1. I want to focus your attention with verse number 6. Verse number 6. The Bible says, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. Verse number 7. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. The title of the sermon this morning is Angels in the Bible. Angels in the Bible. We're going to be doing more of a Bible study this morning. It's going to be a very much doctrinally geared. Uh, but we're going to learn a lot about angels in the Bible. I want to begin this morning uh, with giving you the purpose of angels. Why were angels created? And it's the exact same reason why we've all gathered here today at church. It's the exact same reason why I stand up here and preach. It's the exact same reason why you yourself were created. Look at verse number 6. Look at what the Bible says. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. I want you to turn to Revelation chapter number 4. Keep your hand here and go to Revelation chapter number 4. The purpose of all mankind is that we might worship the Lord Jesus Christ. That we might bring honor and glory and praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the purpose of everything. The reason why everything has been created. Revelation chapter number 4. And actually what we have here are angels not to get into specifics yet, because we're going to look at this shortly. Uh, angels gathered around the throne of God with 24 elders. John is caught up to heaven and he sees a vision of, you know, uh, the throne room, like it is referred to uh, many times, of God. He's looking at, at, and he's not able to see on his face, but he's looking where God is seated. He's looking at his throne. There's many angels around his throne. There's, there's 24 elders. You know what they're doing? They're worshiping God. They're worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to look here at Revelation chapter number 4. Look at verse number 10 first. It says, The four and twenty elders <coughs> fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. And then it says this, For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Every molecule, every atom, every being that God created was created for one purpose. And that is to worship and to serve him. So if we look at we, uh, the starting point of why were angels created? What was the purpose that God made angels primarily? And ultimately it was to bring Glory unto the Lord Jesus Christ. As soon as we see the Lord Jesus Christ being born, what does it say? It says, let all the angels of God worship him. I want you to go with me to Colossians chapter number 2, because I've heard an objection from people before of why you shouldn't preach on the subject of angels. And this is the verse that they'll bring up. Why we shouldn't talk about angels. So look here in Colossians chapter number 2. <coughs> Verse number 18, it says this, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a, voluntary, in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. I've heard people say that we shouldn't preach about angels because it's something that we've never seen before. And it's something that if you're trying to dive into that and you can't understand that, it's just because you're, you're vainly puffed up in your own mind. Now, number one, the context is clearly talking about something totally outside of a, of a, of a Christian believer who's taking his Bible and studying about angels. Obviously, it says here first in verse number 18, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. Obviously, this is a totally different type of person and a totally different type of deception than just a Christian trying to find more out about angels in the Bible. And then it says this, though, intruding into those things which he hath not seen. Now, notice it says intruding into those things which he hath not seen. Now, what does that imply? It's saying or implying that he is trying to get into a subject that he doesn't have access to. He's trying to get into a world that he is not allowed to get into or get into something that he is not necessarily permitted to get into. Now, the Bible was written for us to learn from. Obviously, the Bible tells us that all Scripture is given by inspiration 
of God. And then it says this, and is profitable for doctrine. So let me tell you this to begin with. Anything that is written in this book, it is written for me to learn from and for me to study and for me to preach. The Bible gives the admonition to a preacher and it says, preach the word. <clears throat> if this is the word of God, then I am commanded to preach it. So anything inside of this book needs to be taught, it needs to be studied, and it needs to be preached. Amen. If God didn't want us to know anything about angels at all, then he wouldn't have talked about angels at all. He would have been very much more cryptic. cryptic. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to study what is taught to us about angels in the Bible. Hey, I'm sure there is a lot that God has not told us. I'm sure there is much more maybe about the nature of angels that we cannot know or do not know or was not revealed to us. But the things that are in the Bible are there for us to study and to learn and to grow in knowledge about. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this, the, feet, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children that we may do all the words of this law. There's an example in the book of Revelation, I believe it's Revelation chapter number 10, where there are, there are seven thunders that utter while John is in heaven, right? And he's seeing all these visions. And then he goes to write, and God says, hey, don't write what those seven thunders just said. Now, whatever it was, I have no idea. But God did not want us to know what those seven thunders uttered, which makes you even more curious. Maybe I've always thought, like, why did God even, even uh, include the fact that he told him, hey, Seven thunders uttered. Or he heard the fact. Why did God allow John to even include the fact that the seven thunders uttered? And then that God told him, hey, don't write that down. And I thought this. That what it does is it creates curiosity in, in you. You know what it can push you to do? To study your Bible more. So that's a possibility of why he actually wanted him to record, hey, these seven thunders uttered. But you can't know that. And then it's just like, oh, man. Then you just start getting into your Bible more and studying your Bible more. Which obviously it's a commandment to study your Bible yeah. in the first place. So the things that are in this book about angels, they are there, and they are profitable for doctrine. They are there for us. The things that are revealed were revealed for us and for our children. So we should learn from these things. A preacher should preach these things. And it's a very interesting subject. Now I want you to go back to Hebrews chapter number 1 <coughs> once more. Hebrews chapter number 1, if you're still there. And uh, there's another verse here that I want to read that gives us... Another purpose of angels, really the secondary purpose, the primary purpose of all things is to worship God, is to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're given another purpose of angels. Look at the very last verse of Hebrews chapter number 1. tells us the duty of angels, one of the reasons why they were made. It says this, Are they not, they referring to angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. So right there you get really the <clears throat> what's going to be the secondary purpose of, excuse me, angels. The secondary purpose of angels. And what is it? They are ministering spirits, and it says, sent forth to minister to them which shall be heirs of salvation. So their job is to minister to mankind. Now, angels, I don't know if you really just reading through the Bible, notice or, or, or really comprehend how much or how many times angels are mentioned in the Bible. But really, throughout the book of Genesis, only you'll only go a couple of chapters before another angel is appearing. Another angel is coming. Sometimes a couple of times within the same chapter, an angel's coming and going. The whole purpose uh, outside of, and I'm going to stop uh, you know, uh, referring to this because we're moving on now. You know, uh, obviously, outside of the fact that they were created to worship God, because everything was created to worship God, the purpose that God made angels, the secondary reason, was to minister to those that shall be heirs of salvation, to minister to the saved. He interacts with mankind, but specifically and more so to those which are the children of God. Now, if they can minister, we're going to see this in different ways. They minister to those that are heirs of salvation in a few different ways. And one of the major ways is by bringing messages. They are ministering. Like, what is a, what is a, 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 a pastor referred to sometimes? A minister. And why? Because they are ministering to the people in what way? They are feeding them with knowledge. They are giving them the word of God, right? So that's why they would be ministering spirits. That's another way, because they are bringing the message of God. Something that is important, they would be bringing it unto those that shall be heirs of salvation, those which are 
uh, you know, saved or born again believers. So we can see that that's one of the main reasons why they were created to minister to mankind. When we look in the Bible, what are they always doing? They're always, uh, you know, in some way ministering to those which shall be heirs of salvation. I want you to turn with me to Revelation uh, chapter number 22. I have Revelation 1 down here, but that's not right. Go to Revelation chapter number 22. <clears throat> So I want to uh, give you <coughs> a further understanding of what the word angel in general means. And then we're going to kind of move on to um, uh, angelic beings. Because the word angel uh, really just means messenger. It really just means messenger. When you look at the duties of angelic beings, as I said, they are to minister to mankind. But primarily the way in which they minister all throughout the Bible is by bringing a message. They're always bringing uh, the word of God, or they're bringing a message. That's why the word angel means messenger. But there are a few times in the Bible where you'll see a normal man, just a, a human, uh, that is referred to as an angel. A man will be referred to as an angel. And a perfect, and the best example of this is in Revelation chapter number 22. Look with me in Revelation chapter number 22, verse number 8. It says this, And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Now watch this. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and, watch this, of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. And then he says, Worship God. So what is he saying? Number one, he's saying he's not God. We can see that. And number two, he says, I am thy fellow servant. So what is a fellow? It's, it's two people that have something in common, right? Like my fellow Americans, we're both Americans. Now what is John? He's a man or he's a human being, right? So he's saying, I am thy fellow servant. And then he goes even further than that and says, and of thy brethren, like saying he's a brother with him, right? As in saved is what this, this type of brother is saying. He says, and of thy brethren, the prophet. So this man is considered a prophet. Now that is interesting, and that has always like popped out at me and made me wonder, maybe this is a prophet of the Old Testament. You have no idea. But what is he referred to as as far as the title that he's given? He's given the title of being an angel. So this is a prophet that is standing here in behalf of, or in the capacity at least, he's serving in the capacity of an angel. Why? Because he's bringing a message to those that shall be heirs of salvation. He's bringing a message to a fellow brother, a fellow brother. He says he's of thy brethren, right? So we can see that the word angel is not exclusive to just what we would think of as an angelic being. Now, let me say this. It, it is almost outside of this. I really think that there's only one other time where a human is referred to as an angel. And really, the time where I think that, that this human is referred to as an angel... I don't think that you can even point to any other possibility where a human is true. That's really the only time where it's possible. You know, it's even open for interpretation where the word angel shows up and it's clearly not an angelic being. So this word here in this case, and maybe one other time, is being used about a person who, is, who has obviously died. They have went to heaven in this case. And then they are brought back with John or brought to John in some way spiritually and bringing a message to him from God. And that is obviously the reason why they are referred to as the angel of God. They are ministering from, on, you know, from God to this person and giving them a message. I want you to turn with me now. Let's go to uh, it's uh, 2 Peter chapter number 2. We saw in Hebrews chapter number 1 that they are referred to as spirits. They were referred to as spirits. I want, to, I want to look at a few things about their nature, about the nature of angels. We're going to get a little bit more into this in a little bit when we see some examples, some practical examples, things that are, are explained to us. But I want you to go to 2 Peter chapter number 2. 2 Peter chapter number 2. <coughs> 2 Peter chapter number 2. And then uh, we're going to go back to Hebrews as well in just a moment. So 2 Peter chapter number 2, I want you to look with me at verse number 11. Notice what it says here. We don't need the context. Just uh, We learned something just from this specific verse. It says this, Whereas angels, which are greater in, in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. Now when it says whereas, it's contrasting mankind 
It's speaking about us with angels. And it says, whereas angels, and then it says this, <clears throat> angels being compared with mankind, which are greater in power and might. Now, obviously, this is referring to the, uh, the, the, the physicality angle, right? As far as our nature, as far as our physical being and their being, the Bible says that they are greater in power and in might. I'm going to give you a few examples of this. Uh, number one, I want you to go back to Hebrews chapter number two. We're going to see this one more time. <clears throat> go back to the book of Hebrews, this time Hebrews chapter number two. And while we're here, I didn't point it out uh, in the very beginning, but I did allude to it a moment ago. I just want to read to you again the verse that talks about angels being spiritual beings. It says in verse number 14, are they not all ministering spirits? So notice what they are. They are ministering spirits. A ministering spirit. It also said in verse number 7, who maketh his angels spirits. So what are angels? Angels are spirits. They are spirits. And then it says, this will also become relevant later on. Keep this in your mind. And it says, and his ministers a flame of fire. So notice that. Just take note of that in your mind. I'm going to refer back to that in a few moments. So we see that they are they are ministering spirits. We number one, let's let's just review quickly everything that we've seen. What's the primary purpose that the angels were created along with everything? To worship God, to worship and serve God. What's the secondary purpose? To be a minister to those that shall be heirs of salvation. Then we saw further that, that angels are, in their nature, they are spirits, right? They are spirits. We also saw in 2 Peter 2, which is, we're going to look at that further right now, that they, angels, are greater in power and might than human beings. They are greater in power and might. Speaking of their strength, right? Speaking of the power that they have as far as their physicality, if you will. We're going to see that further here. Look at Hebrews chapter number 2, <clears throat> verse number 7. It says this, Thou madest him, that's talking about mankind and ultimately Jesus, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of thy hand. So notice there, the, again, the comparison that's made between mankind and between angels. And it talks about man. Because the prophecy, when you look it up in the book of Psalms, it's actually about just man in general. And then later on, which is why this is an interesting quotation, Paul quotes this prophecy, and he applies it to Jesus now, because now, of course, God was made a man, so he applies this to Jesus, which is a very interesting concept. We see that revelation that's given of that prophecy of the Old Testament. You can't even really tell it's a prophecy when you read it in the Old Testament. But right here we, says, we see that it says, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. How was he made? He's made a man. The whole chapter is about Jesus being made a man. He's born of mankind, right? So we can see that he was made, uh, he was God, you have angels here, and he was made a little lower than the angels. Again, just like we saw in 2 Peter 2, whereas the angels, which are greater in power and might, speaking of what? Than man. So as far as the power, the strength, the authority, the way in which they operate, they are far superior to man. I want you to go back with me to Genesis chapter number 3, verse number 24. We can actually see this being played out the very first time that an angel is mentioned. Now, it's not the word angel, but there are different sects of angels, different types of angels. Now, that's sex, S-E-C-T-S. -E I'm not talking about S-E-X as far as the gender, right? I'm talking about there are different kinds or different types of angels in the Bible, now, kinds is probably more of a biblical word because when God created everything you know, on the earth, obviously, he made them in different kinds. So there are different kinds of angels, right? So we see, actually, the first type of angel that's mentioned in Genesis chapter number 3. We only get three chapters in, and we see an angel being mentioned. Here in Genesis chapter number 3, of course, this is where we see the deception uh, from the serpent, uh, where he deceives mankind, Adam and Eve, the fall of mankind. We see the, the curses that are given to man and woman. And at the very end, it says this. Look, we'll, we'll read uh, verses 22 through 24. It says this. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. <clears throat> 
Verse 24. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So at this point, of course, they ate of the tree of life, and they're no longer permitted or allowed to come back. They were eating of the tree of life. They ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. At this point, they're no, no more allowed to come back and eat of the tree of life. And God is going to make sure that they do not. He is not going to allow that to happen. And what does he do? This is interesting. He takes cherubims, and he sets cherubims around. He sets cherubims around. If you read it, it says this. I want to point this out because sometimes there's confusion about this. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims. And then it says, in a flaming sword which turned every way. Now what he means by that, I believe, is that there is a cherubim with a flaming sword. Cherubim it would be, in this case, singular. Yeah, you know, if in the English language, which is the way it's translated. So you would, there, would have, there would be a cherubim, which is a type of angel facing every way of the, of the tree of life. Every way would be north, south, east, west, right? On the east side of the garden, that's where this is located. North, south, east, west, and each one has a flaming sword. Now that's interesting because what did he say that he made them in Hebrews chapter number 1? He talked about them being spirits. He said a flame of fire. Now, isn't that interesting? Right away, we see them holding a, a sword that is what? A flaming sword. Isn't that interesting? Not only that, notice when he wants to make sure that mankind isn't going to touch that tree, what does he put there? He puts an angel there. Why? Because angels are greater in power and might. If he wants to keep mankind off of that tree, no man is going to be able to get to that tree if he puts a chariot in there. It's not going to happen. Because, just like we saw, men are made a little lower than the angels. Just like Jesus was made when he became a man, as far as his you know, uh, humanity, he took on limitations and that made him a little lower than the angels. So they're not getting to that. Why? Because angels are greater in power and in might. We're going to see Cherubim been spoken of a few more times here. Look at Ezekiel chapter number 1. It's the next time they're brought up. Ezekiel chapter number 1. If you search the word Cherubim... Or cherubims is how it shows up. If you search the word cherubims in the uh, Bible, it actually shows up both ways. But if, if you search that word, what you're going to see it mostly uh, in regards to is the Ark of the Covenant is the holiest of all, the Holy of Holies. When they made the temple, they had the area where the Ark of the Covenant was and the mercy seat. And they, 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 they were also uh, commanded to make two angels, which were cherubims, that would be over top of the mercy seat in the ark. And they, their, their, uh, their wings were supposed to touch, and they were supposed to be facing one another. The purpose of this was to uh, emulate heaven. It was supposed to look like what it looks like in heaven. So you have the mercy seat. What is that? Like, the, you know, the Bible talks about in the book of Hebrews that we, that we might have. It talks about approaching the throne of grace. The grace and mercy are the same thing. It's talking about God's throne. It's supposed to be like the throne of mercy, the throne of God. That's why it's the holiest of all because we're able to access God, right? And then you have the angels which are standing round about the throne. When we saw the throne room of God in Revelation 4, what else did we see there? We saw angels standing round about, didn't we? We saw cherubim specifically. We would look more at that. So you have Ezekiel. Let me get there myself. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Isaiah, Isaiah Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Sorry about that. Ezekiel chapter number 1. We're going to look at verse number 4. Ezekiel chapter number 1, verse number 4. It says this. It's very interesting. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. A great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And up and out of the mist thereof, as the color of amber, out of the mist of the what? Fire. Notice this keeps being brought up. We're talking about angels. <clears throat> also out of the mist thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. So in general, they have the likeness of a man as far as their likeness, as far as their image, right? What they look like, the outline of the figure of their body. Verse 6, and everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings. Now this is a dreadful creature. When you try to paint this in your mind, I'm sure that it is not even close to actually being there in person and then seeing this creature, this living creature appear before you. Look at what it says next, verse 7. 
and their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. Now, when it says straight feet, it's like it, it goes uh, you know, further and explains it. It's, it's saying how we have our foot is shaped basically like an L, right? It's like a right angle. You know, our foot goes down, and then we have you know, a platform where our foot actually rests. Their foot is like a straight foot, like a calf's foot. It just goes straight down to the ground, and there is no right angle there where our toes stick out and the rest of our foot comes out. They just had straight feet. So it's, when you look at it, it's like the figure or the image of a man, and it has four faces, but then it's feet. So it's like a man, but then its feet are not like a man. That's, 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 you know, that's scary. You just try to picture this thing in your mind. So it has these straight feet that come down, and it's like a calf's foot. I'm not getting near the tree of life. I'll just say, I don't even want to go to the tree of life. Look at what it says there. Uh, verse number seven. And their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man. I guess they, they must be uh, black. Is what's going on here. And, they, and, they're, and uh, <coughs> they sparkled like the color of burnished brass, and they had, that's a good definition of that. I, I, I should have just pointed this out to myself afterward. But notice they sparkled. So there you go. That's a good, it kind of gives you more insight of that. And they had the hands of a man under their wings, on their four sides. And they four <coughs> had their faces and their wings. So their feet don't look like men's feet. Their body, as far as their outline of the figure, looks like a man. But their feet do not. But then they have hands and arms just like a, like a man. They have arms like a man. So they're just like, uh, you know, they're just like this mix. Keep reading there. Look at verse number uh, uh, 7. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. Now that doesn't mean that they're actually connected. They're just saying that they're staying. Like they're, they're in this vision when he sees them, their wings are just like this. You know, basically connected. Like if we were to lock arms and then walk together, right? That's pretty much what's going on here. They're not, you know, permanently stuck together all the time. That's not what he's saying. They're joined one to another for this vision because they stay together. And then, you know, he sees a wheel here in a minute that, that represents something. I have no idea. UFOs or something. I'm just kidding. Look at verse number 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man. The face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. So on, I believe the front would be the face of a man. That makes the most sense. It's mentioned first. That's the primary face. That's also the image that they have or the figure that they have, the face of a man. Then they have the face of a lion on the right side. Then they had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. It would make sense that he named that last. That's what you don't see all the time. It's not the, they obviously don't have the figure of an eagle. That's not primarily you know, uh, their, their uh, characteristic. So the eagle face is on the back. Then it says in verse number 11, Thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. So how many wings do they have? Four. They have four wings total. They have the, the two wings, it says right there, that were joined one to another. So they have wings that are outstretched, that are basically overlapping. And if you think about it, in the, uh, in the, um, uh, the mercy seat, right? In the holiest of all, what do they have in there? There's two wings with their wings touching. It tells you that a few different times their wings are touching. So that's interesting. So here we have two wings that are outstretched, and they're overlapping, or they're joined together, they're touching. But then also it says they have two other wings. It says two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. So they're also, the other two wings that they possess are covering their bodies while the, the, the two are stretched out and joined one with the other. Speaking of the other ones. It says in verse number uh, 12, And they went, everyone, straight forward, <coughs> whither the Spirit was to go. They went, and turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of a lamp. So it was powerful is what he's saying. 
It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. So it was also referring to the aspect of you know, the fire again. We keep seeing that come up over and over again in regards to angels. What is it? Fire. Speaking about the flaming fire, it says that they were ministers, and they, it says that they were spirits, ministering spirits, I'm sorry, and they were made of flame of fire. We see here as well fire being mentioned a few different times. I want you to turn with me now. Let's go over, I believe it's Ezekiel chapter number 10. I don't have this in, in my notes, but the next time they're brought up, I'm pretty positive it is Ezekiel chapter number 10. Yeah, Ezekiel chapter number 10, verse number 1. <coughs> we'll read a little bit more about the cherubims here. It says this, And I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims. Now, when we were reading before, they were not referred to as cherubims. They were called living creatures. They were also referred to, it talked about, uh, I believe, as beasts, I think, was mentioned as well in Ezekiel 1. It says there, keep reading, There appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of of a throne. God's throne is often likened unto a sapphire stone. So over top of them right now, when Ezekiel is seeing this vision, now is the throne of God, and he says that it appears like a sapphire stone. Look at verse 2. And he spake unto the man clothed with linen, and said, Go in between the wheels, even under the cherub, and fill thine hand with the coals of fire from between the cherubims, and scatter them over the city. And he went in my sight. Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. I need some participation here. Where does it tell you that the cherubims are the, uh, are the living creatures? It actually tells you that in one, in one place. Does anybody remember exactly where that is? Verse 15. Verse 20. Verse 15, verse 20, both locations. Yeah, there you go. The cherubims were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river of Kibar. So notice right there you have a connection made. Who, it, it would have told you if you had read the context of Ezekiel 1, he was by the river of Kibar, right? And he, and he referred to them as what? Living creatures. You go to Ezekiel chapter number 10 where he sees this vision again with the throne above. And what does he say the living creatures are? Cherubims. That's what he refers to them as. Now we're going to look at another sect of Angels. So we saw the cherubims there. We're going to look at the seraphims. I want you to go to Isaiah chapter number 6. Isaiah chapter number 6. Isaiah chapter number 6. Remember the cherubims had four wings. Look here at Isaiah chapter number 6. Look at verse number 1. It says this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. Now, is this the same creature? Number one, they have different names. Cherubims and seraphims. But not only that, how many wings again did the cherubims have? They had four wings. Exactly. And they had four faces. Remember? How many wings did the seraphims have? Six wings. They have six wings. So it says, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. And with twain he covered his feet, <coughs> and with twain he did fly. So it makes sense that these wings are stacked in series or successively, one after another. One up towards the top, the upper half of his body, the middle portion of his body, and then the bottom of his body. The reason why is because, number one, it says that he covers his face with one set of wings, right? Then it says also that he covers his feet with another set of wings. So up at the top, that would be the top set of wings. The bottom would be the ones that are covering the bottom uh, portion of his body, which would be his feet. And then also it says, and with twain he did fly. With two, twain means two, with twain he did fly. That would make sense that that would be in the center portion of his body, and that's what he's flying with. So we saw, we saw that the cherubims have four wings, and they were covering their body with one set of wings, and then they were flying with the others, right? Here we see six wings covering the face, one set. We see flying with another set, and then also covering their feet with the other set. Uh, the word cherubim actually just means four. The word seraphim means six, which is what the words actually mean. If you look down and look at verse number three, it says, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. What was the purpose and the reason why everything was made in this world? To do what? To worship God, to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, 
right here, what is quoted uh, uh, in uh, John chapter number 12, I believe it is. This, this passage, a portion of this passage is quoted when Isaiah stands before God. And uh, it says, this said he when he saw his glory. This is quoted in, I believe it's John chapter number 12. And the antecedent to that passage, when you look that up, of who he's talking about, it says his glory. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So that tells you that who's seated upon the throne right here is Jesus. And what is he doing? You'll let all the angels of God worship him. That's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, that's pretty much the description that we get here of the seraphims. But let's go back to Revelation chapter number 4. Where we see the same thing again. We see uh, you know, God's throne room. Just like right there in Isaiah 6. Where Isaiah's caught up and he sees the Lord high and lifted up. And he sees the seraphims. Well, look here in Revelation 4. I told you we are going to come back here and get more of the context. It says this. <clears throat> Look at verse number 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes round, I'm sorry, before and behind. I almost said round about. That's what it says in Ezekiel. So it says before and behind. So these creatures have eyes all over them. It says before, saying in the front and behind. So not only do they have these different faces and multiple sets of wings, Obviously, that's scary and dreadful enough, and they have a straight foot, you know, a foot like a cat, but they have eyes constantly. So when you, like, look over at this thing, like, when it turns around, it's still looking at you. You know, it doesn't stop watching you. When he turns around backwards, he still sees you. You know, the one guy can see you with his, the, the cherry vips can see you with their eagle's eyes if they wanted to, because the eagle's in the back of their head. They have, you know, the faces all over them. But look at what it says also. Look at verse number seven. Uh, and the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them, watch this, six wings about him. Now what is this, a cherubim or a seraphim? See how you can learn things from the Bible? This we can identify as a seraphim. We can see this is the same exact angel that was in Isaiah Chapter number six, can't we? Why? Because they have six wings, and cherubims have four wings. Not only that, you know that one of the major differences, it's a similarity, but a distinction between the cherubims and the seraphims. How many faces did the cherubims have? Well, one of those that had four wings. It had four faces. Is that mentioned about the seraphim? No. But basically what happened is those four wings are, are the, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, those four faces, each one is just given independently to each wing. Or to each angel, goodness sakes, to each angel, right? So it says there, if you notice, and the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf. So these angels are all seraphims, they're of the same kind, right? But they have distinctions within this kind, where one looks like a lion, one looks like a calf, or like an ox is what you know the cherubims are like. I'm sure it's probably the, the same appearance. And the third beast... Uh, had a face as a man. Notice it's also again referred to as a beast. And then the fourth beast, fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So the cherubims, they have each one has four different faces, and it's the same as these, right? Four different faces. One angel has four faces, four different faces. But the seraphims, they only have one face. And one of them will have the face of, of a calf or like of an ox. Another one will have the face of a lion. Another one will have the face of a man. It will look like a man. And then the other one, the fourth one, because only mentions them be, there being four, the, the fourth one will have the face of an eagle, right? So we can see these similarities but distinctions between the cherubims and the seraphims. Uh, keep looking what it says here. <clears throat> Very interesting. It says, and the four beasts, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, the four beasts uh, had each of them, we're in verse 8, six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, watch this, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. What, was the, what were the, the, the angels saying that had six wings in Isaiah chapter number 6? Holy, holy, holy. And where were they? They were before the throne of God. You see the great consistency between the Bible here? Just extreme consistency that's given to you. So who stands before, specifically right before the throne?
according to Isaiah 6 and Revelation 6, directly before the throne, we can see that seraphims do. Seraphim angels do. I want you to turn now with me to Genesis chapter number 19. So those, those are some of the crazier angels that are mentioned in the Bible, angelic uh, creatures that are mentioned in the Bible. You know, these would be referred to as like heavenly beings or, or angelic beings, celestial, which just means like heavenly, celestial beings. You know, these are, these are specifically angelic beings. They're not just, just angels as in, uh, you know, just referring to them as being a messenger. Uh, but these are specifically angelic beings. Look at uh, Genesis chapter number 19. We're going to see that some angels just look exactly like a man. They just look just like a man. You can't even distinguish between these angels and then other men. Look at Genesis 19 verse 1. It says this, And there came two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat at the gate of Sodom, and Lot seeing them rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. <coughs> and he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him and entered into his house, and he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round about, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men? which came into thee this night, bring them out unto us that we may know them. So all the Sodomites, when they look at the angels, what do they say that they are? Men. Did they, did, they, did they say there's anything different about them? Are they acting, did they you know, uh, uh, you know, have any reservations or anything about these particular beings? No, they just said bring them in out unto us, right? They came into thee that we may know them. So they, what do they think they are? Just regular, normal men. Now, I will, uh, I will posit this to you quickly, so I'll give you a couple possibilities about this. What did we see in Revelation 22? You may or may not have thought of this, but what did we see in Revelation 22? We saw an angel. He was, it was clearly an angel, and what was he? He was, uh, he was a fellow servant of us, wasn't he? He was just a regular, normal man that had died and went to heaven and was being used in the capacity of an angel. Now, we can learn a couple of things from this. Number one... This could be just, just angels that are that look in appearance like a man. But you know what also it could be? It's possible. It could just be a man that had died already and went to heaven with God. And then he was, these men were sent back. Because you're not given specifics about this. I mean, these men could be used in, a, in the capacity again as an angel. And that's why they look like a man. Why? Because they are a man. Because, you know, uh, you know, John wasn't even able to tell the difference there between an angel and a man, right? Uh, you know, so that, that uh, one other point that we can learn from that is this. Uh, from Revelation 22, I forgot to, to mention that while we were there. So when we see this happening a few times in the Bible where a man and an angel can be, uh, you know, uh, interchanged or can be confused with one another, not only do they confuse men for angels, but they confuse angel, angels for men. So we can prove that... There are angels that look like men. That would be an actual angelic being. We can see that from Revelation chapter number 22. So sometimes it could be an, an actual angelic being that, that comes down to earth that just looks like a man. But do you know what else it could be? Like we saw in Revelation 22. It could just be a man that is being used in the capacity of an angel. Both are possibilities. Both of those things are possibilities. I want you to go with me now to, uh, actually I'll just read to you from Luke chapter number 20 verse number 35. Give you a quick fact about angels. The Bible says this, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead. Talking about the saved, those that would be able to go to heaven. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. So they say that they are... Um, I cut off half of the verse here. I'm sorry, but it's, it's quoted somewhere else. But this verse is quoted, I believe, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's not quoted in John. But it says that they are like, the, they are like unto the angels, which neither marry or are given in marriage. So that tells us that angels themselves, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Now, there is a, a, a doctrine that people have, a pet doctrine, where they think that in Genesis chapter number 6, that angels came down and they mated with 
the sons of men. I don't believe that for a few different reasons. I believe that I can prove very clearly that, uh, you know, it, it says sons of God, which the sons of God every time in the Bible, it's never referring to angels. It's always referring to saved believers. So I believe clearly that this is talking about those that called upon, called upon the name of the Lord. It was the line of Seth. And, uh, you know, when it talks about, you know, uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, you know, go to Genesis 6. Let's look at it. We're in the book of Genesis. Go to Genesis chapter number 6. I don't want to misquote anything. Genesis chapter number 6. It says this in verse number 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, sons of God, always in the Bible, is referring to saved believers. It is never referring to angels. It is never talking about an angelic being. You can even get the definition of what a son of God is a few different times in the Bible that it is referring to to a person that put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's good to, dis to, to be able to discern that while reading your Bible and while we're studying the subject of angels, to know that sons of God, sons of God are not uh, angels. They are actually men that have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we read this, this, is, this has nothing to do with angels at all. And uh, people have a doctrine from this where they think the sons of God were the angels, and they came down and they saw the daughters of men and they took all of them, you know, whichever they chose, and then they started like this new race of people, you know, this hybrid between men and angels, and that's why the world became so wicked. No, the reason why the world became so wicked was because the sons of God, which was those that were calling upon the name of the Lord at the very end of the chapter before, those that called upon the name of the Lord were those that are saved. They saw the daughters of men saying all of the people of the world, because there was a separation between people and tribes and things at this time. They went in and just took any wife that they wanted, and then the basically God's people mixed with the heathen. And what, what, what are you going to get when you mix good with bad? You're going to get bad, always in the Bible. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. That's what happened, and that's what brought about the great wickedness in the world. So just, just to put that in there real quickly, the sons of God, they're not angels. The sons of God are referring to saved believers. So I want you to turn to um, I want you to turn to Jude. Jude. So there are a couple of specific angels that are that are that are named. We're given their names. <clears throat> They're given a, a level of, of prominence, if you will. Jude is the uh, second to last book in the Bible. <clears throat> this particular angel is is a is a captain. He's referred to as the the archangel. Which means like the top. That's what an ark is. It's referring to the top like a captain, saying that he is the captain. Look at Jude, the book of Jude. There's only one chapter. Look at Jude, verse number 9. It says this, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed over the body of Moses. Uh, Durst not bring, bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Now I want you to notice that Michael is given a specific title here, and he is referred to as Michael the Archangel. So what does that mean? It means that he is, he is a captain, or he is one of the angels at the top. I want you to go to, uh, go flip over since we're so close to Revelation chapter 12. The book of Revelation chapter number 12, verse number 7. Revelation chapter number 12, verse number 7. The Bible says this, And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. One thing that I wanted to point, point out to you here was notice it says Michael and what? His angels. So what does that mean? That means that he's ruling over these angels because he is the archangel. He is the captain of these specific angels, right? And then it says, and the devil and his angels. Now, I'm not going to get into this, but most people are aware that the devil, you know, Lucifer was an angel. Lucifer uh, was an angel, and he fell, and he took one-third of the other angels with him when he fell, when he left, right? Uh, when he left heaven. I want you to go with me now to Daniel chapter number 12. Michael is actually mentioned in the Old Testament as well. Daniel chapter number 12, the book of Daniel. This is actually a prophecy of what we just read about there in Revelation chapter 12. Daniel chapter number 12, <clears throat> excuse me, 12, verse number 1. says this, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, 
which standeth for the children of thy people. And he said, there shall be a time of trouble. A couple of things there. Number one, Michael's mentioned again. What is he referred to as? It says the great prince. That's him being the archangel or being the captain. That's why it says his angels, right? He's ruling over them. He's the great prince. Not only that, we see here it says this. The great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. What is the purpose of angels again? They are, sent, they are ministering spirits sent forth to be ministers to those that shall be heirs of salvation. What is the purpose of these angels right now? Who are they standing for? They're standing there to protect, he says, thy people. Who is that? He's referring to Israel, for spiritual Israel, those that are saved. So notice again, every time that they're mentioned, they're all, they're always, uh, it's always consistent. There's great consistency in the purpose of angels. There are many times where you can see uh, the angels ministering. A couple of, uh, of times is where Elijah falls asleep under the juniper tree, right? And what happens? The angel comes and ministers unto him. What does he do? He gives him food. He sees, he, the, Elijah wakes up and there's a, a, a stinking angel here with, with coals of fire, and he's like cooking in food. And there's an angel next to you. Can you imagine, you know, falling asleep and then waking up, and there's like this, you know, there's, he's got the coals set up, and he's flipping something. It's like, what in the world, right? Well, not only that, you have a, 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 the aspect of protection. Well, you have even in Matthew chapter number 4, it actually says, after the devil left Jesus, it says that angels came and ministered unto him. So him being a man at that time, you know, he took part in the ministering portion of the angels coming. It says angels came and ministered unto him. Those exact words. Uh, you have uh, with Elisha, who was the, uh, you know, who, who, was, who, who succeeded Elijah. He came after Elijah, right? He was the protege of Elijah. He and Gehazi are, have the army that comes and encompasses them, right? And I believe it was Syria. They come and they encompass them. And Gehazi is terrified. He's scared and he's worried and he's like, alas, master, right? You know, what are we going to do? And then what does Elijah say? Elijah's like, don't worry. He's like, those that are with us are more than those that are with him. Now, I'm sure as soon as Elijah said that, he's like, he has officially lost his mind, right? There's nobody there but, Eli but Elisha, I'm sorry, and Gehazi. And then, it's, uh, and then uh, El Elisha prays to God and says, Lord, open his eyes. And then it says that Gehazi looks around and that there are like numerous angels encompassing them round about, right? In chair I believe it even says in chariots, but there's numerous angels that are, that are scattered around them. You know, that goes, that goes with the verse in uh, the book of Psalms that talks about how the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. So that's, uh, you can see a fulfillment of that particular passage. So what do we see the angels doing there? We see the angels protecting them. What are they doing? They're ministering unto them. So there's different ways in which angels will, will minister to man. Sometimes it'll be an angel of protection, right? Sometimes they'll be coming to you and bringing you the word of God, ministering to you the word of God, right? Uh, you know, angels are spirits. Angels are spirits. Go to uh, Numbers chapter number 22. We'll go to this real quick. So we're going to look at a couple of more characteristics of, of just angels in general, and then I want to look at the angel of the Lord in the Bible for about maybe 10 minutes, and then we'll be finished. So go to Numbers chapter number 22. Numbers chapter number, number 22. <coughs> we'll see here that, that angels are spiritual beings that are invisible, just like I just quoted to you or, or uh, 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 told you about the story with Elisha and Gehazi. They couldn't see all those angels about, around about. Right? Until he opened his eyes. We're going to see that same thing here in Numbers chapter number 22. It's in, uh, it's later here. Look at verse number, um, look at verse 27. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled. So the ass obviously sees the angel of the Lord, right? Was kindled and he smote the ass with a staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee? that thou hast smitten me these three times. And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, and would there were a sword in mine hand, for now would I kill thee. But, you know, he's referred to as a, 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 a crazy person in the New Testament because of this. And he's mad. Look at verse 30. He's speaking unto the ass. It says in verse 30, And the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever want to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Then it says this, verse 31. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord 
standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand. And he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. So I want you to notice that just by nature, we cannot see angels. Just in the, their natural state, they are invisible enough. Why? Because they are just the spirit. We cannot see them unless God allows us to see them. Or maybe puts them in some form or some state in which they are able you know, to be seen or visible to us. Uh, I want you to go to, uh, go to Genesis chapter number 16. Notice the angel of the Lord was mentioned there. So we're going to look at a couple of passages of the angel of the Lord being mentioned. There's a lot of different, uh, you know, theories on who the angel of the Lord is. Some will say that it's Jesus Christ. Some will say that it's a specific angel each time. Some say Gabriel. Some say, you know, Michael. I'll give you my opinion on that here in just a moment. But the angel of the Lord is mentioned repeatedly all throughout the Bible. Look at Genesis chapter number 16, verse number 7. It says this, And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence comest thou? Camest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hand. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. Now, number one, what do we see the angel doing again? Ministering. We see the angel ministering here. Not only that, further, we see that one thing I want to point out about oftentimes angels in the Bible, specifically the angel of the Lord... They're sent forth for a message uh, on behalf of the Lord, and they will speak in place of the Lord. And I believe this is because they are speaking by the Holy Spirit. I believe that God's Spirit is speaking through them in the exact same way that, that God spoke through Isaiah. Just like he says, my words which I have put in thy mouth. He's speaking to Isaiah. That's in, in the book of Isaiah. When Isaiah will preach or speak, how will he speak sometimes? It's almost like he is speaking like the Lord, isn't it? It's, if you were to just read some of the verses, he's like, he is talking. He's saying, you know, I have sworn by myself. The word has gone out of my mouth and shall not return unto me. That's Isaiah 45, right? So what's going on there? That's Isaiah speaking. What is he doing? He's speaking like in the stead of the Lord, isn't he? And that's because the Holy Spirit of God had filled him up and was speaking through him. Well, that's what I believe the same thing is going on here. Many times when we see the angels come, we just see them speaking, you know, uh, uh, basically being filled by the Holy Spirit. They are speaking in the place of the Lord. God is speaking through them, really, is a better way. God is just using them as an instrument, and He Himself is moving them, like it says in 2 Peter 2. He's moving them and speaking the word of the Lord. We'll see a, a great example of this. Go to Genesis chapter number 22. Genesis chapter number 22, this is uh, Mount Moriah when, when God commands um, uh, Isaac, I'm sorry, Abraham to take Isaac up to the Mount Moriah to sacrifice him. Of course, he's trying him, he's testing him. It says this, when the, it says the, when the angel of the Lord comes to him, it says in verse 15, and the angel of the Lord called Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, by myself have I sworn. Now who's speaking? It's the angel of the Lord. It says, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So it's interesting how the angel of the Lord is speaking there, you know, in the stead of... God, I want you to go to Exodus chapter number 3. Exodus chapter number 3. Exodus chapter number 3. We'll see something similar to this again. Look at verse number 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Oro. And it says this, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. A couple of things I want to point out. Hebrews chapter number 1, they are spirits, but they are what? A 
flame of fire. Notice who appeared unto him here. Who was it? Was it God, specifically? No, it was the angel of the Lord. David Bernard, that idiot, the, the, a true modalist, won this. You know what he says this is? He says that this is one of the modes or one of the manifestations of God. This is not even specifically God. This is the angel of the Lord appearing unto Moses. Just to show his stupidity and lack of discernment when it comes to the Bible. This is the angel of the Lord. And notice that the, that the, the, the bush is burning, right? The bush is burning. Why? Because angels are a flame of fire. When Ezekiel described the cherubims, what did they look like? He said a flame of fire is what they look like. That's how he described them, right? He said their appearance was like unto a flame of fire. And like lamps that burn, he said. Isn't that, doesn't that make perfect sense when you see here the angel of the Lord? And what, how does he appear? As a flame of fire, the, the burning bush, right? This is the angel of the Lord here. And why? Why is it that he cannot see specifically the angel? Well, they're spiritual beings. And your eyes have to be open in order to be able to see them. Well, God, in this case, decided not to allow them to actually see, you know, specifically their nature outside of them being a flame of fire. Now, can we understand that in every aspect? Of course, that can be a little bit confusing. But we can see that their nature is spirit and flame of 